A very warm welcome to you. Many thanks for joining us on this week's edition of the program. We remain your source for all the latest happenings in the world of business. My name is Lucy Lube. You are welcome. We have an exciting lineup for you on this week's edition of the program. First, we join Faith and our guest, Professor Shegun Adjibola, a professor of economics, Babcock University, Ogun State. On the CEO of Rendezvous, we had discussed the current state of the Nigerian economy, a critical look at our fiscal and monetary policies. It was, as always, no holds spared. Take a listen. Let's first of all put things in perspective. When we talk about diversification, we are saying that we should cultivate relationship with all the segments of the economy where we can move away from that monolithic problem of let's say oil and gas so we have to look outside that main source of revenue for nigeria which is oil and gas then we are talking about agriculture we are talking about the manufacturing segment we are talking about the service industry Let's talk about that because we are talking about what have we done and what we have what have we not done. Let's talk about agriculture. We've tried a lot. Central Bank of Nigeria introduced the Anchor Borrowers Program, which is to break some majorly financing gap and solve some fundamental shortages we have in terms of input into agriculture. So if the financing is there they be able to solve that. We've done fairly well, but the problem is money will not solve all the problem. We will also bring you excerpts from the launch of the Women in Insurance Kenya, which happened on the sideline of the 48th AIO conference in Nairobi, Kenya. The objective of the Kenyan Women in Insurance Association is to mentor, inspire, and grow. Let's take a look. We bring you each week on the program. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the lineup. Details in just a moment. Please stay with us. The biggest fund platform for the insurance industry. Welcome to you. It's a pleasure to have you join us on the CEO Rendezvous this week. As you know, on the CEO Rendezvous, we have serious conversation with top-rated personalities in the Nigerian economy. Today is no different. I'll be speaking one-on-one -on -one with Professor Shegun Ajibola, who is a past president of the Chartered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria. He's currently a professor of economics at the Babcock University, Ogun State. Together on the site, we'll be looking at the current state of the Nigerian economy, a critical look at the fiscal and monetary policies. Thank you so very much, Prof, for finding time mm -hmm. to join us on the program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Prof, um, Nigeria is currently facing serious fiscal and monetary problems. Um, <laughs> the list is actually endless. Rising budget deficit, high debt profile, uh, unemployment rate, uh, foreign exchange crisis, uh, food, high food prices, and just name it, as I said, the, the list is endless. And a lot of people 
have asked this question. And I'm going to put it to you. How did we get here? What is happening? Yeah, and thank you very much. We can say that we are no exception to the global crisis that has affected every segment of our national life. <clears throat> Uh, now and in the immediate past, we do know that our economy is so vulnerable to so many things over the years. We have a monolithic structure. We depend almost entirely on petrodollar, which turns to oil revenue upon monetization. We do know that We've been having lots of battle with food insecurity due to so many reasons. We do know that our foreign exchange market is also susceptible to so many things due to our high import contact in every segment of the national economy. Accumulatively, We've suffered two types of recession in the last five, six years, 2016, then 2019, uh, 2020, due to the last one, the first one, majorly because of the shortfall in oil revenue we were unable to grow at the pace that will see us moving in terms of the rate of growth in the GDP. We recorded negative growth, so we went into recession in 2016. We came out of it in 2017. Then the pandemic came, and with all the other challenges manifesting in our own economy as a violated, that again led us to another recession. So it's it's accumulation of factors. Uh, and we've been trying to get out of the crisis for quite some time. But most of those things require some fundamental changes, some structural reforms, so which will take quite some time. So some of the solutions are long term in nature, but we must start somewhere to put things in proper perspectives. Okay, Prof, speaking of putting things in proper perspective, uh, some of the problems you have um, enumerated now as part of the reason why we are where we are today in the economy. If I recall properly, in the last 10 years, this narrative has been the same. Uh, over dependency on uh, crude oil, um, our economy is susceptible to so many things. This, this has been a narrative in the last 10 years, at least. Let's put it mildly, in the last 10 years. And nothing has changed. So the question is, why do we keep finding ourselves in, in this vicious circle, so to speak? <laughs> <laughs> it's is, it is just because we, we find ourselves in a situation where fundamental solutions to some of those problems must come up. And originally, we've not been able to get to that point where we find solutions to those long-term uh, uh, repeatable and uh, repeated problems on the matters that concern the economy. So it's like, like you said, it's like vicious cycle. We, 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 we have problem with the agricultural sector, the issues, the matters that keep coming up to prolong those problems in that sector. They still remain with us. Then we talk about even the secondary segment of our national economy, manufacturing and others. They are also bedeviled by lots and lots of issues, lots and lots of problems. So that the, the, the manufacturers, they've not been able to find solution 
to some of the problems facing that segment of our national economy. We keep talking about cost push inflation, cost of basic raw materials keep propping up at every, every, uh, every now and then. And at the end of the day, those cost elements will be part to the end users. Then we start talking about cost push inflation. We talk, keep talking about the pressure coming from those segments of uh, our national economy. So by and large, we discover that one, we've not been able to solve the structural problems bedeviling the economy. Structural problems in terms of diversification, uh, diversification of the economy away from oil. That still remains with us. We okay, are, so Prof, we are no, we are nowhere diversified <laughs> as an economy. Okay, so we've been talking about diversification of this economy. In fact, I can't begin to uh, mention the, some of the ministers that have come to say oh, we need to diversify this economy. And we are still talking about it in 2022. I don't want to be pessimistic or be seen as being pessimistic. <laughs> 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 5 years from now, we'll still be talking about diversification of this economy. But in, in real terms, what would you say is the reason why we have not been able? Um, as people say, sometimes finding solution to your problems will be first, the first step will be to even identify, identify the, the problem. Problems. Okay, for us, it's pathetic because we've identified a problem, but finding solution to it is like, it's defying all odds. So I want to say, what, what, what would you say is the major reason why the Nigerian economy has not been able, has not been diversified uh, to the extent that we want, that we are not over dependent on this petrol dollar that you talked about? Let's, us, let's first of all put things in perspective. When we talk about diversification, we are saying that we should cultivate relationship with all the segments of the economy where we can move away from that monolithic problem of, let's say, oil and gas. So we have to look outside that main source of revenue for Nigeria which is oil and gas. Then we are talking about agriculture. We are talking about the manufacturing segment. We are talking about the service industry. Let's talk about that because we are talking about what have we done and what, we have, what have we not done. Let's talk about agriculture. We've tried a lot. Central Bank of Nigeria to do the Anchor Borrowers Program, yes. which is to break some major financing gap and solve some fundamental shortages we have in terms of input into agriculture. So if the financing is there, they'll be able to solve that. Right. We've done fairly well, but the problem is money will not solve all the problem. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the problem. So we are now talking about how have we fared in agriculture yes. as a critical segment of our national economy. And that can take us far away from that monolithic structure. We still need to look at some other things away from just providing funding for the agri. Agriculture is a highly specialized business, specialized vocation. So if the money is there, the skill, the skill sets have to be there. I happen to work in one of the first generation banks where agriculture was a major segment of that bank. And the agricultural unit happened to be under me at the time. It's not easy. You have to train agriculture experts, agriculture officers, those who have this key, who can follow up with the farmers in the states at the local government level who can ask the right question who can provide solutions to problems some of which come up suddenly and they will need that technical skill not money now technical skill to be able to to resolve certain issues it could be weather condition it could be it could be pestilence it could be anything and unless you are in a position to address all this even the farmers themselves will find it difficult to perform optimally 
who find it difficult to, 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 to operate profitably. I happen to be in the agricultural sector. And I know the problems I, I confront. I know the kind of consultations I, I, I make. I know the kind of sudden issues that come up. So we must be in a position as a country to provide all this money from the technical skills, from the uh, plus the expertise, from the skills, I mean, plus the skill sets. Then we'll be able to move fully. We have, we have moved a lot from where we used to be in agriculture to where we are today. But we still need to move much faster than where we are. Come to manufacturing. So we are talking about diversification. Come to manufacturing. Most of the basic inputs that we need today, they are imported. And we are talking about vulnerability to the foreign exchange market. So they need dollar. And the exchange rate is moving at a pace. <laughs> that the, 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 the finished products, the manufactured products, cannot keep pace. Because there is limit to what consumers can pay for these basic products. So you, if, <laughs> if prices continue to increase, it will get to a point when there will be consumer resistance. And the various products will just be there. And they'll be looking for alternatives here and there. So we need, first of all, to pursue this program of import substitution so that we'll be able to substitute some locally made products for the manufactured ones. At that rate, we will be able to save or to reduce our exposure to the foreign exchange market and our exposure to imported raw materials. The slogan has always been there. Produce what you consume. Consume what you produce. We need to pursue this more aggressively. Then when we talk about the service sector, let's look at even some other countries of the world. Singapore, for example, has no natural resource of any type. It's information technology and other service-related products that the export to the rest of the world. It's one of the fastest growing economies economies in the world today, that's Singapore. And we have some other economies. Yes, they don't have half of our population. They don't, we don't have, they do, they don't. And we have some other countries. We used to be at the same level of development before. But because they were able to diversify away from that monolithic kind of structure, they are far ahead of us in terms of uh, the level of development. Talk of Malaysia, we talk of... Uh, uh, South Korea in particular, even India, India and some others, Indonesia. So if we are able to look at some of these things and we are saying, let's reduce our high propensity to consume imported items, then we'll be able to reject our manufacturing sector and be able to rely more on locally made products. Then if the manufacturing sector comes alive, much more alive than what we have today, then we'll have done better. Then we'll talk about agriculture. Then we'll talk about services. So it requires pragmatic actions. And the will must be there. And we must be in a position to say that this is where we took off and this is where we are now. In terms of accountability, in terms of pro productivity, Okay, so Prof, in the last 10 years, would you say we have, um, as a people, by that I mean those who should know, those who should take um, this critical step to put us in the right uh, path, do you think or would you say there has been accountability, number one, or two, would you say there has been any sense of direction to take us to where we are supposed to be? Where we can help it. For example, in the area of agriculture, we have done a lot. We've seen sense of direction. We've seen commitment. We've seen improvement. We've seen productivity. There's no doubt about that. We're talking about the uh, rice uh, pyramid some uh, weeks or months back. back. But we can do more based on what I've highlighted. For example, Central Bank of Nigeria introduced that novel program, Anchor Borrowers Program. The central bank itself is not equipped to monitor what is happening on the feet. 
doesn't have the, his bankers, bank, banker to government. Not banker to consumers and to retail uh, end of the market. So for such a program, as novel as it is, they will need, and that's why I talked about uh, trained agricultural officers before, they will need those who can help the farmers monitor progress, provide advisory services, provide the, 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 the skill sets to be able to deliver accurately. The biggest fund platform for the insurance industry. Welcome back. Moving on, we now bring you excerpts from the launch of the Women in Insurance Kenya. The push to have association of professional insurance ladies in every country is being championed by PILA to have better representation for women in the C-suite in all the arms of the industry. Happy viewing. Pillar 
Kenya has just started today. We came with a flyer where we enumerated some of the benefits of being members of PILLAR. I have spent about three decades in the insurance industry, but I can assure you that I've never, the, the highest number of trainings, management trainings I've received is through PILLAR. And this is because this is because Pillar does not just meet, and I give this advice for Pillar Kenya. We don't just have a meeting. We have meetings with trainings. So we have resource people being invited at every meeting that we have, usually um, by monthly, twice a month. And we have training to make sure that our members are moved up to these issues. And indeed, our members are growing in terms of moving on to the cadres at every um, sector of the, of the insurance industry. I would like to appreciate the efforts of our past presidents, one of which being the wife of the, pres the president of AIO, Ms. Tonya Smart, for the efforts in pushing pillar. I also have another um, past president here. Okay, she's not here, I think she's left. And Mrs. Sade Luga. They have all made so much effort to push and he has agreed that AIO will make Pillar Africa a subset of every AIO convention and conference. Leadership is difficult, uh, leadership is ambiguous, and leadership is uncertain. So we as women have two choices. Either we conform or we adapt. So we can conform to the situation, we can conform to the environment, or we can adapt. That's our time on the program this week. Many thanks for being a part of it. Join us again, same time, same station next week for a fresh package. In the meantime, feel free as always to connect with us on all our social media platforms. Don't forget to join us on our flagship Pigeon English radio program, Waiting Insurance Day Joseph, on Ninja FM 102.7 every Wednesday by 9.45 a.m., powered by Nikon. My name is Lucy Lube. Until next time, and from the entire crew, it's goodbye.